I want you to take a deep breath. And I want you to feel the presence of God that is within you and all around you. And this weekend, we begin our time of prayer and meditation with remembering all the men and women who gave their life in service to this country. All the men and women who paid the ultimate price. Jesus said that there was no greater gift than this than to lay down your life for a friend. And so today we acknowledge those men and women and their families and friends who paid the price for our freedom, for our nation, for our republic. And this day we give thanks for each one that they paid the ultimate price. And today we remind ourselves that, that there's a cost to living in a free land. And it's not just paid by a few, but it's paid by all of us. It's paid by all of us doing our part to move our country forward. To do our part in ensuring that our nation continues to be a land of the free. So tonight, today we hold all of those individuals in our hearts and prayers. And we recommit to our responsibility to move our country forward, to vote, to be an active member of our, of our country, to do our part in the celebration of democracy. And this week we all behold all of the children of our nation that we hold every child as safe, that every child can go to school and come home safely. And we pray for every child and every family. We see every child. And that we know as a nation that we can solve this problem. That this isn't an issue for the right or the left. This isn't a political issue. This is an issue because we value our children. And we want every child to know that they are safe. So Spirit, open our minds. Beyond the simple answers, beyond the rhetoric, to a way that we can ensure that every child is safe. That every child can go to school know that they are safe. That we pray for our nation today. We pray for all that our nation is and all that our nation is called to be. That these are not simple times. These are not easy times. But these are the times that we live in. So each one of us understands our responsibility to move our nation forward, to be the best version that our nation can be. So in all things, God guide us, in all things direct us, in all things inspire us to a higher possibility. For whatever we think the answer is, in God there is a higher possibility. There is greater good. And when we get stuck at looking at any problem, that this is the answer, we know that there are always more. It is always greater. So we come, to, to come together as one nation under God. One nation under God. So this morning, in a moment of silence, I ask that you pray for our nation, for the men and women who paid the price for our nation, for our children, that they are saved, that they can live the best version of themselves, that we pray for all of our citizens.
Thank you, God, for this moment, for this ministry, for this great country. Let each one of us be inspired to do our part. Let us not take this country for granted, but invest our time and our energy in making this world a better place. So in all things, God, we look to you and we give thanks. And so it is. Amen. All right, you ready for today? Yes. Uh, 45 minutes. 35 minutes. <laughs> God help anybody between me and the door, 1201. <laughs> Have you ever experienced profound grace? Yeah. You know what profound grace is? Grace isn't one of those experiences that when we're having them, we know something special is happening. We, we know we can feel it. There's these moments where we know we didn't earn what was happening, but there's, there's magic. There's, there's something happening. And, and grace is the highest level of God's good that we're aware of. God, grace is that overflowing goodness that we can't earn that is just a free gift, and we either open to that experience or not. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about accessing grace and, and how do we really open our mind, our heart, our soul to experience more and more grace in our life. And as I thought about this talk, two situations, two events out of my past really came just screaming to the surface about moments where I knew that I was in, in the experience of grace. So the first one, those of you that, that know Phoenix, I was driving up uh, Cave Creek Road, and it was about 3.30 on a Friday afternoon. And if you've ever been on Cave Creek Road, it's a, it's a four lane, two lanes each way. Some parts, it, it's six, but mostly it's four. And, and the cars are going 50, 55, 60 miles an hour on this road going back and forth from Carefree back to Phoenix. And it was, you know, as I said, late afternoon. And I wanted to see if I could like there's this earthen dam that they built there to keep floodwaters back. And I wanted to see if I could get across that to go for a hike on the other side. So I slowed down to make a left-hand turn in the left-hand turn lane, and there was a full-ton work truck behind me, too close, and who wasn't paying attention. And as I slowed and moved into the left-hand turn lane, he clipped my right rear fender and instantly broke my seat so my I laid back and and my car spun two and a half times um, in oncoming traffic and when I stopped I was facing going with the oncoming traffic so I was facing the opposite direction I was going and I actually it looked like somebody had parallel parked my car I mean it was right in the right exactly where it was supposed to be it looked like it like one of those cartoons where somebody spins them and then they just end up right where you're supposed to be. And just on the other side of that parking spot was a 30 foot drop. So if, if I didn't stop there, the other, it, it was, it was, no. and, and I, you know, <laughs> I was kind of shocked and dazed as I got out of the car and the guy turned around and came back and we called the police and we got each other's information and all that. Well, when the police officer got there, he said, first thing he said was, you should not be alive. He said, I, I have been on more accidents on this road and for you to spin out two and a half times into oncoming traffic, there's no way you should be alive. And, and I was a little freaked out before he said that, right? <laughs> right? So I was a little, you know, and and he just was so clear. I mean, he was, he was straight. He said, I don't know who you are, and I don't know what you do, but somebody has got your back because you should not, you should not be here. He said, I, I've seen it. You, no. And, and I instantly knew that, that something happened, right? And, and I, because once you're, once you feel it, once you open to it, you can feel the energy of grace. You can feel that energy of being wildly blessed. Three weeks ago, it was a Sunday, I, I did two services. Some of you know my youngest grandson was having his first birthday, so then I drove up to Flagstaff 
And after the party and everything with all the festivities, um, I drove back down to Phoenix. And, and after driving and talking and, and services, I, I, was a, I was a tired pup, right? And, and my two little munchkins, my dogs, um, <laughs> still wanted their walk. And, and, I, and I got the great idea that, and I do this occasionally, I was gonna ride my bike, do the same walk, do the same mile we do, but I was gonna have them on the bike so I could just kind of get through it quickly and get it over. And if they run their mile, they, they burn more energy and it was just a win, win, win. Well, Gracie, the, our littler one, got spooked by something and ran across in front of the bike. So I slammed on the brakes and launched myself over the handlebars. And I don't have as much rubber in my body as I used to, right? <laughs> like, so I landed full on side up and down and with a big, <laughs> with a big thud, right? And like, it, it hurt. I mean, it, it hurt. And so I just kind of wobbled back to home and with the dogs and the dogs were freaked out because they knew something, you know, they could tell something was going on. So I, I got up the next morning and I was sore, but I was able to drive up and I was here on Monday. I wasn't moving very fast, but I was here. And then on Tuesday, I literally couldn't get out of bed. Like, I, like there wasn't an inch on my body that didn't hurt. And my wife said to me, I didn't make you go to the hospital on Sunday. I didn't make you go to the hospital on Monday, but guess what? Today you're going to the emergency room and they're gonna make sure that you're okay. And so when, when you can't get out of bed, it's a little hard to fight that process, right? <laughs> so they, I went to the ER and, and just a fabulous ER doctor. And, and she looks at all the stuff and they take x-rays and, and she said, you know, um, let me just examine. And, and so she starts poking my ribs and she gets to one and she can wiggle it. And, and apparently they're not supposed to wiggle, right? <laughs> And I, and I levitated off the table, off the bed. I mean, I, I know how to fly. It just requires a broken rib. And you literally, I, I, I'm sure that's how Jesus walked on water. Like that, like there, I was going up. I mean, I, and it's like, I'm hyperventilating. And she, she says, well, we know that one's broken, but we're going to do an x-ray on the rest of them to see how many are broken. And it turns out there was just that one little wiggly one. It was the only one that was broken. And she gave me some lovely little things and, um, and got me home and, and it was good. And, you know, and the next, and Jilly and I prayed that night and woke up in the morning and I had no pain, literally no pain. And I, and I, I kind of tested the process. I wiggled it to see if it still, and it still wiggles. Even now it's don't, don't press too hard because it still wiggles. But from Monday, from Wednesday morning to now, two and a half weeks later, I don't have any pain. And if you've ever had a broken rib, I've had broken ribs before, it, it's weeks of pain. And I haven't had, occasionally I get a twinge that I can feel that it's still kind of loose in there, but, but no pain for the last two and a half weeks. And in, and in fact, you know, uh, Wednesday, you know, Wednesday day, I stayed kind of motionless. Thursday, I was kind of just watching TV on the couch. And Friday, finally on Friday, my wife said, you really don't have any pain? I said, no, I just, I felt so good on Wednesday. Thursday, I felt so good. I felt, I mean, I just felt, I felt like I was 20 years old. I felt so good. But by Friday, my wife said, then maybe you need to go out and clean up the backyard, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> when she was convinced I really had a little mini miracle, okay, now go put it to work by cleaning up the backyard, right? So today, what I want to talk about is that level of grace. Because most of us are working really hard at life and there's a level of life that's better. That's better. And that we can access grace. Not that we earn it, because you can't earn grace. Grace is the free gift from God. Grace is the infinite goodness of God and we either accept it or we don't accept it. And when we accept grace, the possibilities are endless. It's so much bigger, it's so much more powerful. There's so many levels of life that are available to us that we can't earn our way into, but they can be given to us as a free gift because we are God's beloved. We are children of the infinite. 
And God wants to give us. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is all around you, right? And the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Like we are the children of the infinite. And all the blessings of God want to be bestowed upon each one of us so that we can live with grace and ease. Because every time it's harder than in our heart and our soul, we know that it needs to be. It's an opportunity for us to move back into grace. And one of my favorite little prayers, it's called the, the grace prayer. Can you shoot it up there? There it is. And I'm gonna invite you to affirm it with me. If you wanna take a screenshot or we can email it to you, if you wanna join. But this, this prayer is powerful, it's transformative. So let's, if you can read it, let's read it together. If you can't read it, I'll read it for you. Here we go. For thee I thirst, into thy hands I commit my spirit, my soul, my body, my life, this problem, all unforgiving states. Thy will is my will. Thy will be done through me. Heal me at death. Reveal that which needs to be revealed. Heal that which needs to be healed so I can glorify you, God, and live in the fullness of your grace. See, one of the things I think that we have a responsibility is when we experience a miracle or when we experience these moments of grace, I believe that we have a responsibility to talk about them. Not just to receive them, but to share them with others. Because sometimes in our life, we just begin to believe that life is supposed to be hard. And when you hear that somebody had a miracle or somebody had a moment of, of just profound grace, it really inspires us to say, well, well, I want mine, right? Well, if they got grace, is there, is, did he just, because he's a minister, did he get grace? Or is it because he's stupid that God just helps him out? I mean, how does that work for him, right? But I want us all to live in profound grace levels of grace, where we just feel the grace of God, that we don't try to earn it. It just blesses us over and over and over again. So Dave, give me the next slide. Put up, put up the triangle, will you? So here's the triangle. And I, and I want you to see this as like two different levels of light, maybe three different levels, but at least two different. That grace is the pinnacle of being blessed. That whatever is going on in your life, when you feel like you're living a life of grace, when you feel like you're, you're downloading the grace of God, it is the highest level of good. So grace is it, right? Then, then the next level down is this dance that we do between forgiveness and karma. And, and what I want you to see is in every moment of every day, you're making the decision between forgiveness and karma. That over and over again, you're making the decision, do I want to live in grace Then I have to forgive? When I don't forgive, I want you to see that karma steps in. And karma is that in, in the Hinduism and Buddhism, karma is the, the, the human outworking of past experiences through the spiritual law of giving. So, sh so shall you give, so shall you receive. So what I want you to see today is that in every situation, if you're willing to forgive, that forgiveness is the human level of grace. That every time you forgive, you are participating in grace. Because you don't have to forgive. Nobody is ever required to forgive. You have a God-given right to hold a resentment for as long as you want. And that's the role of karma. When you hold on to any resentment, when you hold on to any upset, you then move from forgiveness into karma. And then once we're in karma, it takes you as long as it takes you until you're ready to forgive. And then once you forgive, you move back into grace. And then over and over again, then every moment, every upset, every disappointment, in that moment, you make a decision, whether it's conscious or unconscious. At that moment, you make a decision. Am I going to forgive and stay in grace? Or am I going to stay in unforgiveness and have to work it out through karma? And that's really your only choice. In every situation, do you have to forgive anyone? No. You can go lifetimes, as the Buddhists teach, 
You can go lifetimes without forgiving and work everything out over and over again. And what I want you to see is, is karma is such a slow process. Because in karma, you have to be the victim and the victor. You have to be the one hurting and the one being hurt. And you have to work it out so many times until your heart opens and you're willing to forgive everyone for everything. And when we live from karma, it takes, the Buddhist belief, it takes lifetimes. But if you live in forgiveness, you're always living in grace. And most of us don't think there's a cost of unforgiveness. We just don't believe it's like, it's my given right to resent you. Well, yes, it is. Like you have a God given right to resent and be upset with whoever you want to resent and be upset with. But the moment you do that, you then move out of grace and into the law of cause and effect, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And, and you can live from that human paradigm, right? You have a God given right. You get to as much time, as many experiences, to go over and over and over again till you're so sick and tired of being sick and tired, you're willing to forgive. I forgive everyone for everything. Together, I forgive everyone for everything. One more time. I forgive everyone for everything. That also applies to you. Like if you don't forgive yourself, you're still living karma. Like if you're not forgiving yourself, you're still in the human dimension of having to go through experience after experience after experience until you forgive yourself for everything. That there is no way other than forgiveness to stay in grace. Because even if you use karma, even if you spend lifetimes doing this drama over and over and over again, it doesn't change until you forgive. And the moment you forgive, you're back in grace because it's our way, it's the human level of grace. And once we stay in forgiveness, then we are just automatically open to the infinite grace of God. Does everybody have at least one person in your life that if you tell yourself the truth, you haven't forgiven? Does everybody have at least one thing that you've done that you still haven't forgiven yourself for? What I want you to see, <laughs> George is waving his arm in the back, right? One thing, so what I want us to see is we can't afford that anymore. Like how many lifetimes do you want to spend in this drama until you forgive? It's like, well, he doesn't deserve my forgiveness. Nobody deserves your forgiveness. You don't deserve your own forgiveness, right? But you're going to give it to yourself anyway. And you're going to give it to everybody else. Because the grace of God is worthy of you forgiving every human foible. No matter how much you were hurt. No matter how much you were disappointed. No matter what they took from you. No matter what a jerk they were. They deserve, you deserve forgiving them so that you can move back into the grace of God. So over and over and over again, in every experience, I want this to be so crystal clear in your mind that when you're wounded by life, I want you to say, do I want to work this out through karma or do I want to stay in grace and forgive instantly? Now, you get all the time you want. God's not going anywhere. God's old, but God's not that old, right? God's not going anywhere. And so over and over again, I want you to see that you have a way of releasing all the karma from your past. You can clear all the karma of your past. And as you forgive others, you actually clear and help them clear their own karma. This is how Jesus did it. In Luke 23, 34, uh, 34, Actually, it's verse 34. Jesus said this. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Right? And over and over again, in that moment, he cleared them of their karma. He cleared them of the, the mistake, of the 
choice, of the decision, of the sin that they were making in that moment, he said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And at that moment, Jesus had no karma from that experience. There was nothing his soul needed to work out from the cross. He went through the experience, he forgave it completely, and he lived in the grace of God. Now, I know some of us have been through some really difficult situations. And I know that if you've been through a difficult situation, forgiving someone seems impossible. But what I also want you to know is that you are going to forgive it. It may not be today. It may not be tomorrow. The Buddhists teach it may be 100,000 lifetimes from now, but you are going to get to forgiveness because we all have to go back to grace. Grace is our natural state and our natural relationship with God. So the question then just becomes, how much time and energy do you want to spend outside of grace? How much time do you, are you willing to, to give to your resentments, and would you be willing to forgive everyone for everything? How many of you know what Ho'oponopono is? Right? Ho'oponopono, it is the it is the Hawaiian process of reconciliation. How do you spell it? H-O apostrophe O-P-O-N-O-P-O-N-O. And there will be a test later. So Ho'oponopono is the Hawaiian process of reconciliation. Now, why is this important? Well, if you live on an island, reconciliation is important because there's only so far you can move away from somebody, right? In an island, you're all there. All your exes are still on the island. All your old friends are still on the island. All your old employers are still on the island. Everybody that you've ever hung out with is still on the island. So you have to figure out a way to live in reconciliation because everybody's there. You're going to see them over and over and over again, and you can only go so far, right? So there's this method of bringing people back to grace, bringing people back to reconciliation. Over and over again, there's these four steps, and it all begins with, I'm sorry. And sometimes our ego doesn't want to say, I'm sorry. Sometimes our ego wants to say, I was right. The dirty dog deserved it, right? I was right. But I'm sorry is that thing that begins to open our hearts. I'm sorry for anything that happened to you. I'm sorry for the, the problems, the challenges, the things that you've gone through. I'm sorry. When you see somebody on the street and you just silently whisper, I'm sorry for whatever happened. I'm sorry. And, and, and to really acknowledge our role in this. See, if you really look into Ho'oponopono, the Hawaiians believe that we are responsible for seven generations. So when you were saying, I'm sorry, it's not just what you did, but it's what, what happened through your family for seven generations. So when you were saying, I'm sorry, you were clearing not only your own karma, but you were clearing karma back seven generations for anything that your family had ever done to harm or hurt or injure anyone else, right? I'm sorry. I remember a woman came to me one time. She had been terribly abused, terribly abused. And I said to her, I'm sorry this ever happened to you. And she said, well, you're not responsible for this. And I said, I, I know I'm not responsible for this, but you didn't deserve this. You just didn't deserve it, and I'm so sorry. And these big tears started streaming down her face. And she said, you know, nobody's ever said I'm sorry about this. To all the people I've told about this, no one's ever said I'm sorry. That there's something that is healing in her soul when another human being can look us in the eye and say, I'm sorry for what you went through. I'm sorry that this was so hard or this was so painful or this was so, it's, it's just, it frees us. And sometimes in our, when we're living from our ego, we just don't want to admit that we're sorry. We don't want to take responsibility. We don't want to, we don't want to just ha have to feel the feeling of saying, I'm sorry. But it all begins with, I'm sorry. Then the next line is, please forgive me. And, and sometimes when we say, please forgive me, it's like, well, I didn't do that. I didn't get them on the street. Or I wasn't a part of that decision. Or I, and it's just like, please forgive any part that I've played in creating an experience that has ever harmed you. At whatever level. 
Again, if you look at it generationally, please forgive anything out of my past, any karma that I have had. Please forgive any way that I've participated in this experience. And the next one is thank you. Thank you for being in my life. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your light. Thank you for coming into the world. Thank you. And the last one is I love you. I love you. Because in love, we are all healed. In love, it is the sign of grace. Love is the highest level of God's good. And when we say I love you, when we truly offer each other unconditional love, we are extending the grace of God to each other. So I want you to think of a person in your life that you've been working on forgiving. Anybody. It can be your fourth grader or friend or ex-spouse or whoever it is. And we're just going to do these steps together, right? So if you're comfortable, I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to say to them, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for anything that I've ever done that's ever harmed you. I'm sorry for anything that was difficult or painful. I'm sorry for the times when life was hard for you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please forgive anything that I've done consciously or unconsciously. Think anything that my soul's ever done in our history. Please forgive me. Thank you for being in my life. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for blessing me. Thank you. And I love you. I love you. Let's take that into prayer. And I want you to see our world today in all the ways it is all the challenges, all the needs, all the problems, and just pick any one of them. And today we say to the, the entire world, I'm sorry for your pain. I'm sorry for your disappointment. I'm sorry that life is tough. I'm sorry it's scary. I'm sorry that you're going through what you're going through. I'm sorry to the whole world. Please forgive anything that I've done that has added to your problem any thought, any belief, any actions that I have done that's added to the pain of the world. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you for coming into the world. Thank you for being a part of my life. Thank you for sharing this earth with me. And I love you. And not only do we say that to everyone else, but we say it to our own soul. We say it to our own body. We say it to all the relationships that are important to us we are willing over and over again to come back to forgiveness. I forgive everyone for everything. And I am completely forgiven. In the name and through the power of the living Christ, we give thanks. And so it is. Amen.